I'm really glad you came to church this morning. You know, uh, those of you that are joining us online, I'm glad that you are joining us as well. There's just something special, though, about what's happening inside this room. I wish I could transmit it to you who are watching us online. And I, I believe that you're going to be blessed by watching it. But there's just something really special happening here in this place right now. And I'm glad that you made it. Praise God. Yeah. We have a special guest speaker this morning, and he is my overseer in the MFI organization, which is Ministers Fellowship International, and his name is Bob Johnson. Bob, come and share with us what God has laid on your heart. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you know, it is, it is good to, it's always just good to be with God's people. Uh, I, we, I'm from Montana, and so we, we weren't as strict as you guys, but we had about I don't know, I think about 10 weeks or something like that, 12 weeks that we couldn't meet. And, and the first service, first live service I got to go back in, I was actually in a church in Kalispell speaking. And during worship, I started to weep. Because I, I just, uh, there's, a, there's just a preciousness about God's people. And, and there's something about worshiping together. And I, I understand there's people that, right now because of health and so on have to stay at home i'm really glad you're listening on online but uh, uh it is really precious to be together amen um before i get in the message i, I want to put in a plug for your water baptism service i love water baptism uh in the the, the pastor talked about type typology that um in the uh, in in the bible it says that uh, the Israelites were baptized into Moses in the Red Sea. It's, it's a picture of our water baptism. And, and, and a couple of things happened. One, they got free from their past because their past actually literally followed them, the Egyptians. Maybe you didn't read in the Bible, but maybe you saw the movie. <laughs> anyway, the Egyptians followed them. And, and, and uh, I mean, I, I would have loved to have been there. That was... Do you guys ever think about this? I always wanted to, like, fish stick their heads out and look, or, you know, because part of the waters, and they walk through, and then the, the army of Israel, of Egypt, came after them, and, and God covered them over. So their past, God actually killed their past in the Red Sea. And when we get water baptized, there's, a, there's a really a powerful um, destruction of our past. I, I don't fully understand, but I know it works. And the other thing is, from then on, they were known as the people of God. Before that, they were runaway slaves. And when you get water baptized, you're baptized in, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You're like marked by God. So if you've not been water baptized, you need to do it. Somebody say amen. amen. And that was all free. That was not a part of the message. That was all, all extra. So uh, turn your Bibles to uh, 2 Peter. I were, Cindy and I have been here, oh, this is our third time here, and we... Uh, uh, what happens is because uh, I uh, at this I'm semi supposed to be semi retired. Uh, pastored a church in Montana for 39 years. We started it with nine, and now it's a whole bunch of people. And uh, but we pa we passed the reins to a younger. Uh, my son-in-law actually is now the pastor, and and at this stage of my life, we just go and go to other churches. And uh, but what happens when you go? To church a few times, sometimes God just begins to put them in your heart. And uh, you guys are in my heart. Uh, and some of you don't know me. Some of you are thinking, well, who are you? And uh, I'm Bob. I told you. They actually made a movie about me. It's called What About Bob? <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, but you, you just have a wonderful pastor and, and wife. They're just, uh, they're, they're good people. Yeah, yeah. And so we're blessed to be there. And we've got to know some of your leaders, uh, Stacy and Judy, I think. And, and uh, just uh, hanging out with leaders yesterday, that was fun. And um, this is a good church. If you're if checking it out, this is a good church. Stick around. This is, uh, this is a good family church. This is a, I, I, I particularly love how you pray over the kids. I, I noticed that the last time I was here. And I, I told them, I like that. That's a, that's a nice you know, it's, it's important prayer with kids. Amen? Amen? 
So, um, I want, we're, how many in the Bible waiting for me to start talking about it? All right. So, in uh, Second Peter, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk, um, I'm going to talk about the end times today. Um, and uh, somebody say, wow, he's going to do prophecy. And no, I'm not. Um, I, I'm not an end time, I'm not an end time expert. I, uh, I, I've, I've read the Bible lots of times, but I, I, I don't even understand a lot of stuff in Revelation. I, I have opinions, and I think lots of people have opinions, but, but I think the things we need are what God makes really clear. How many know that? Yeah. And there are some things that are kind of mysteries, and that's okay when it gives us something to talk about and, and debate about. But um, about a year and a half ago, I really felt God put this on my heart. He said, I want you to do a message on the end times and uh, it, 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 because of my, what I do now that I travel so much, it, I, I felt to preach this in, in a number of the churches that I travel to. And I, I had no idea. It was before COVID. I had no idea what was going to happen. But how many know right now is a crazy time? Um, you know, it's just different. We've never encountered anything like this. They shut churches down. We have, uh, you know, we had to wear masks. I hate wearing a mask. I wear them. I wear them. I'm submitted. But I hate doing it. You know, for one thing, I, I have this really nice beard, and it makes it go like this. <laughs> it's actually not that nice a beard, but it, it, it makes my face longer so I look skinnier. That's why. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> but the mask makes it curve, so I, I look lopsided. <laughs> anyway, um, but it, it's, it's a difficult time. I mean, there's, um, you know, there's stuff, with, obviously, with COVID, but... Uh, the, the, the racial tension in our country and, and uh, uh, economics and, and just stuff happening. And uh, I, I believe God's called us to be different from other people in the midst of this. And that's, that's really what I want to talk about. Because uh, e even though like this may seem like the worst times that ever happened, there have been lots of really bad times throughout history. Yeah. Um, and every, every generation has thought that they lived in the last times. And in, in the year, one, year 999, people sold everything, gave it to the church. In the year 1001, they were trying to get it back because yeah. they, were, they were absolutely sure Jesus was coming back in the year. But, so what we don't know. I don't know. Man, maybe you have some good ideas and... And um, I, I share the first service that talks about a, an hour, of, a half hour of silence in Revelation. And that's so we can get all our charts and figure it out and get them corrected. But I do know how I'm supposed to be. And so I wanna, that's what I want to talk about this morning. So let's uh, go to this passage in Peter, uh, 2 Peter. And uh, the, the, the whole chapter kind of addresses this. But in verse 10, he says, But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything in it will be found to deserve judgment, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this. Does, it, does anybody have a new pickup truck? No. It, it's going to be destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> all the stuff that we think is so important and we get all fussed about, it's all going to burn. It, now, now, if it burns early, that really bug, bums you out. <laughs> but but it, part of that is to help us keep it in perspective. None of that stuff's really that important. What, what's important is our lives and people's lives and, and, and Jesus. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives should you live? Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in flames. But we're looking for a new heavens and a new earth, he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. I actually think about that sometimes. In Revelation, there's no sorrow, no tears. You know, have you ever looked at stuff in life and said, that's not right? You ever lost somebody to sickness and you said, that's not right? Or, I mean, Christians get cancer and die. You say, that's not right. I, a few years ago, I did a funeral for a lady in our church, and she was maybe the kindest person I've ever met in my life. She was
she and her husband were both like that. And she had long, lingering cancer, and then she died. And I said, that's not right. Well, this world isn't right. This life is one night in a cheap motel. Let me, let me explain that. A number of years ago, one of our pastors did a message on, on uh, heaven. And uh, he said, if you won the lottery, if you, won the, if you got a letter in the mail that said, if you fly to New York City, you'll get a billion dollars. You won a billion dollars. You just have to fly to New York City. And so you got there, and they put you up in this horrible seedy hotel with a lumpy mattress in the room and bugs in the room and the flashing lights you know, across the street. and you, But you knew tomorrow you're going to get a billion dollars. Would you really complain about the room? Because tomorrow you're getting a billion dollars. And this life is just one night in a cheap motel. Then we go to heaven. Amen? Amen? And, and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we... Because it seems like a really long night. <laughs> but it's, it's like that. And it's over. And then we have eternity. So he says, since that's going to happen, we're looking forward to a world filled with God's righteousness. So dear friends, while you're waiting, that's the title of my message, while you're waiting. So we're, and, and this, this concept is actually throughout scripture. It says we're pilgrims and strangers. We're, we're passing through. While you're waiting, he says, why, why, and, and you're all waiting now. You, 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 if, if you haven't met Jesus, we'll, we'll help you at the end of the service to meet him. But so we're, we're waiting for something to happen. While you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. In um, Luke chapter 18, there's a story of a, a woman that wants a resolution from a judge, and, and Jesus is teaching on prayer, and he says, uh, and the judge blows her off. So, oh, I'm not going to do it. And, but she just keeps bugging him until he finally does it. And, and Jesus says, this is what I'm looking for. So it's persistent. And then he says this, uh, when the Son of Man, is talking about himself, com comes, when he returns, will he find faith on the earth? So I'm going to come back to that, but he's looking for this faith. In, in 2 Peter, this is from the Message Bible, it says, same passage I just read, talks about all these things, everything's going to blow up and burn up, and, and uh, we, my wife and I, we're, our church, we do a Bible reading program, and we just finished Revelation. And uh, how many know there's a lot of weird stuff in Revelation? Yeah. And, and uh, she would, kept asking me these questions, I kept saying, <laughs> I don't know, but it's bad. You know, like, the, like scorpions and stingers and, and plagues and all, all that stuff. But, but here's what the Bible says. He says, but we'll hardly notice because we'll be looking the other way. Isn't that good? And he's talking about serious stuff. There's serious stuff going on in the world right now. We'll hardly be looking the other way, ready for a promised new heavens and promised new earth, all landscaped with righteousness. So my dear friends, since you have, since this is what you have to look forward to, and, and, and I, I just love this statement. Do your to be found in purity and peace. What, 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 God, what do you want? I want you to be doing your very best. You going to play a song? You want me to do a different microphone? Just use this one. Right? Take this one off? All right, this is not working well. There. All right. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. All right. I, I just hate technology. First time I put a headphone on like that, I felt like Britney Spears. I was so self-conscious, and then I wanted to burst into song, you know? Because <laughs> you, you, if you don't have a microphone, like, you can really dance. You know, you can, all right, anyway, I, I'm digressing here. So um, he, let, let's pray. Let's pray, and that'll, that'll get things back on track. <laughs> No, you just interrupt. I was really being pointed right then. You should have played a song. That would have been cool. All right, let, let's... Um, when we come together, uh, you guys gave worship to God. You weren't just singing songs. You were worshiping Him. 
But he also wants to give to you, and, and he's, he lets me do that today. But what really makes it work is the Holy Spirit takes what I say, and then it makes it personal to you. How, how many of God things the pastor never even really said? And so I, I really want that to happen. I want God to speak to you, because I know that some of you really, right now even probably maybe are struggling with what's going on in life. And I believe God wants to help you in that. So would you lift up your hands like you're going to receive the Lord, and we're going to pray together. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, you love these people. And God, I know you want to minister to them and help them. So God, give me grace and wisdom to speak what you want spoken. And God, you, you take the words that I speak and you tailor make them for each person, the unique circumstances of their life. God, you know them and you know them where they're at now, and you love them where they're at now. So, God, you want to bring life to them and freedom and hope. And So, God, help me just to be a vessel for you. God, I, I just pray your anointing and your grace on this time. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. So, so, the world's crazy, all right? We'll, we'll accept that. And, and honestly, it, always, it has been since Adam and Eve fell. There's been sin in the world, so we live in this broken world. And, and we're waiting, we're in this posture of waiting for the Lord to return. Now, whether it's going to be next year or 100 years or 1,000 years, it doesn't matter. We still have this expectancy. It's all through Scripture that we have this expectancy of the Lord's return. In fact, I, I believe we should live like he's coming tomorrow, and I believe we should live like he's coming a thousand years from now. Do you, you, do you understand? And the Bible says, I want you to uh, occupy the ground you're in until I get there. But, but so how are we supposed to live? That's, that's what I want to talk about today. Because that's, that's really what matters. Um, you know, who the beast is and, and what the five toes and the, whatever. All, that stuff is is not as critical as how, how am I, as a follower of Christ, supposed to live in a broken world while I'm waiting for the Lord to return? And, and how am I, as a, as a person, a Christian, living in this world where, where the economy's funny, the, the racial tension, the COVID, all that stuff's going on in the world, and people are really panicky right now. There's people really... Um, in parts of the country, just a lot of fear. And how am I supposed to live? How am I, how am I supposed to be in that? I, I, when um, Montana has, has we, 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 have a, we have a better governor than you guys have. No, we, 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 we were a little bit easier on the rules, but initially when COVID came out, people were really nervous. They were, how many remember looking for toilet paper? Yeah, okay. And... Uh, I went to the store one day, and, and it was, uh, they had a deal where if you were over 60, you could come from 8 to 9 in the morning because you were probably a little more vulnerable. And I went in there, and there was a whole bunch of young people in there. So I, I said to the clerk, I, I said, I thought this just was for us old guys. And she just lost it. She said, what am I supposed to do about it? And, and I realized she's freaked out. I mean, I... I I remember going to the store and just there was so much on people's faces. There was like panic. Can you remember going to stores and seeing that kind of thing? And uh, I, I think God wants us to be different. Amen? Yeah. Just a, a different kind of people. So how are we supposed to live? Let me give you three things. Number First, it says in this passage, we're, we're to live in holiness and purity. Now, um, I, I'll read the, read the scripture in, in uh, Peter Second Peter says, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives should you live? Now, I grew up in the church. I got saved when I was about four and a half years old. But I had this from my late teens until my almost about 29. I was backslidden terribly. So I've kind of experienced both worlds. But I really know the Christian world. I grew up in it. And when I would hear things like that, you need to be holy. We sing songs about it. We need to be holy and godly. The truth is it used to scare me. See, anybody identify with what I'm talking about? Because I, I, would, I would look at my life 
or even just the thoughts that would get in my head, and I think, I'm not, I, I'm not there. <laughs> are you guys, maybe you guys are a lot nicer than I was, or I am even. Um, e- even now, I, you know, I mean, I honestly try with all my heart to follow God, and I, I just mess up. And, and it's, stuff will pop in my head, and I think, God, I, I'm not at all like you. You realize he's perfect? He's ho- we can't even describe what his holiness is. It's so great. He says, I, w- I want you to be holy like me. Well, I, I, think, I think we misunderstand some of this stuff. And so I, I want to help you with it. In, in Micah 6.8, it was actually one of my favorite scriptures. Uh, he says, this is what God wants. How many want to know what God wants? Okay. So Micah 6.8, it says, uh, he's, he, the Lord has told you what's good. And, and what he requires of you, do what's right. How many know what's right? Raise your hand if you know what's right. Really, some of you don't know what's right? Come on. Do you, you ever see something happen and you say, that's not right? I mean, you just, I mean, just even natural stuff, that's just not right. That person shouldn't die. That, you shouldn't act like, you know, we, we kind of have a sense of what's right, and then we have the Bible that teaches what's right. And the Bible says we should do what's right, all right? But I want you to love mercy. NIV says I want you to do justice and love mercy. And people sometimes love justice and we do mercy. God said, no, I I want you to do justice, do what's right. But I want you to love mercy because we all are recipients of mercy of God. Amen? Amen. So I want you to do that. And then I want you to walk humbly with your God. That's, that's, that's the essence of what the Christian life should be. Do what's right, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. In the, in the Message Bible, he says it another way. He says he's already made it plain how to live and what to do and what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what's fair and just to your neighbor. Treat people right. Jesus, a guy came, what's the great commandment? He said, well, love God with all my heart, mind, and soul. He says, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, you do those two things, you pretty much got the whole package. He says, be compassionate, loyal, in your love. And then he says this, I love this. He says, don't take yourself too seriously, but take God seriously. Um, don't take your successes too seriously. The good things you do. Uh, how many get excited when you do something good? Yeah. Finally, I did something good. No, you, you know, you feel, and, and that's okay. God doesn't say, well, don't, but, but understand anything good comes out of you, it's because of God. It, it, can you get that? I think we all know that one, right? I'm going to tell you something that maybe you don't know. Don't take your failures too seriously. When you Sin is serious. Sin will kill you. And sin kills people and destroys lives. But don't get wrapped up in focusing on the sin in your life. Focus on the Savior in your life. This this is just so important. And I believe there are people here that need to get this today. I've pastored for over 40 years. And I've watched Christians just get bound up because they failed somewhere. And they think, man, I just, and and they they actually stop letting God do things with their life because of their shame and their guilt from it. And 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 we we have a savior. Focus on the cross. I I didn't use this scripture in the first service. There's a a tremendous scripture in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. It says this, it said, God made him, and speaking of Jesus, to become sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. Now, now here's, here's what that means. When, um, you know, a lot of times at Easter, you, you guys probably just had an Easter service, uh, pastors will speak about the cross and the horror of the cross and the nails and the, the whipping and the beating. And we, we say, oh, that's so terrible. That really wasn't, that was just a picture of something. That really wasn't the horror of the cross. The horror of the cross is this. 
that when Jesus went to the cross, he took all my junk on him. And he took your stuff. And you think, just, just for a second, think of the worst thing you ever did. And maybe you don't want to think about it, but just God took it off of you and put it on Jesus so that you could become the righteousness of God. And if God put it on Jesus, I mean, I, I, it's hard for my mind to even comprehend this, but at one time on the cross, all the sins of the world, all the shame and, and degradation of the world was put on Jesus. That, that's the horror of the cross. So that I could be righteous. If it's put on him, it's gone from me. Do, do you see that? I, I, when, I, when I first started really serving God, I, Cindy and I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in a little church in Alaska. And, and uh, the devil would, would bring up stuff from my past. And I'd go, and, and, and he'd say, how can you be anything? You did this, and you did this. And, and there, there were things God actually brought up, so I had to repent for him. But one, one what, what I just, I, I had a hard time escaping some of that shame. And then God began to give me a revelation. He said, Jesus took that. It's not on you. A dead man did that. You're alive now with Christ. And, and I'm, a, I'm a righteous dude. <laughs> I, I'm holy. I, I'm holy. Not because I'm a pastor or I'm preaching. I'm holy because Jesus made me holy because he took away, took away my junk. And so don't focus on the sin, focus on the Savior. Amen? Amen. We're set free. You, you, you got the righteousness part? You got it? If, if you don't get it, I'll have to say it all over again. All right. Number two. Let's go to number two. This is how we live in these in dark times, whatever they are. Number two, he says, uh, I want you to live in peace. Matthew 5, 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called children of God. So we're to be a people of peace. And, and, and I think this is really important because we live in a world of turmoil. Um, the Bible says Jesus is a prince of peace. And he is our peace. And in reality, I can't make peace. But I think you could translate this as a peace bringers. You, you, are you, are you, the, the, the Hebrew word for peace is Shalom. It's actually one of my favorite words in the Bible. And if you study it out, it, it, in its essence, it means the way things are supposed to be. It, it's not just the absence of conflict, but it's like the restoration of things that, to be the right way. And so God says, Bob, you're in this world that's broken and people are panicking. Do you, do you realize people without Christ, they don't have hope. Bible says they live in darkness without hope, without Christ in this world. Ephesians says that. And so in the midst of that, I'm supposed to bring peace wherever I go. Now, unfortunately, sometimes because we, we freak out with the stuff going on and we look at it with a natural eye and we say, oh, they're doing this or, oh, this is happening or who got elected? And, you know, we just, we, we, and God says, no, Bob, I want you to be a peace bringer in the midst of turmoil. Because you're different. You have hope. I, I, I told you, I got saved at four and a half. My whole conscious life, I've had hope. Even when I was backslidden, I had hope. But the people I encounter in the world, they live without hope. And so they find false hope in things that I go, well, that's not good and that's not good. But the reason is because they're just looking for something that gives them hope, something they could... Maybe it's money, maybe it's success, maybe it's uh, pleasure, you know, something. But I have hope. And so because I have hope, I, I, I can bring peace to these people. Look, look at uh, this, this passage in Timothy. Timothy uh, 2, verse 1 and 4 says, I urge you, first of all, pray for all people. 
How, how many think that's a good place to start? Yeah. Just pray for people. Guy cuts you off in traffic. Pray for him. Don't. We go, you know, I don't know. pray you God burn your car. <laughs> now pray for him. <laughs> um, I urge you, pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. Give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all. Everybody say all. All, all who are in authority. Well, what about guys I don't like that are in authority? Pray for them. I, um, in my devotions, um, I, I, I have two, compa- Sydney and I have these two compassion kids uh, where we, we send money every, every month and it, it buys them school stuff and helps them. And it, it's a great ministry, Compassion International, great ministry. And uh, I, I hate writing letters, so I, I, Cindy writes them. I, I have, I've never written them a letter. But I thought one thing I could do, I could start praying for them, but I, I always forget. So what I do, I put in my Bible, in, I read Proverbs every day, and I put their pictures, they, they give us these little bookmarkers, in Proverbs, so, I, so it reminds me to pray for them. And every day when I do my devotion, I read the Old Testament, then I read Proverbs, and one chapter, and, and then I, I pray for those two kids, uh, Patricia, and well, they, they, they told us to change their name. He has a really long, funny name, it's, but we call him Archie. So Patricia and Archie, uh, one's from Kenya and one's from Sri Lanka. And, and when I pray for them, I pray for their village. I pray for their leaders of their village. I pray for their pastor and their church. And I pray for the leaders in the nation, compassion leaders. And I pray for their national leaders. I pray, pray for the national leaders that, God, you'd lead them to righteousness and that they'd, uh, you know, you give them wisdom to govern their countries. And uh, when I was praying one day, God said, why don't you do that for your own country? I went, wow. <laughs> you know, maybe you're a lot smarter than I am. You got it's all figured out. But I, I occasionally would pray for our leaders, but I didn't do it regularly. And so now, whenever I pray for Kenya and Sri Lanka, I pray for the leaders of our nation, and I name them. I say, Lord, I pray for uh, President Biden and Kamala Harris and and uh, uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. Somebody have a heart attack just now. Um, <laughs> And and I pray for uh, Mitch McConnell, and I pray for Kevin McCarthy, and I pray for uh, 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 our governors, Greg Gianforte, and I pray for uh, Steve Daines as our senator, and John Tester as our senator, and Matt, uh, Mac, uh, Matt Rosendahl. I, I name them, and I pray, God, give them wisdom. God, lead them to righteousness. God, men, you, you know what's happened? I... I I never feel a need to complain about them. I, I actually, they're in my heart. Matthew says where, where your treasure is, there's your heart. So if you pray for something, what happens? Your heart goes towards them. So I, I look at them different. I, I, even when they speak, I hear them differently. I, I'm listening to somebody that I actually love because I've invested lots and lots of prayer in these people, which, by the way, is what the Bible tells me to do. Why? Because I'm a peace bringer. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, and God, I'm just so glad for their policies. They're, they do things, I, on both sides, they do things I don't agree with. But that's not the issue. I pray for them as people that Jesus died for. And what it does is it, it changes the way I look at life and I look at people. And also, I believe it's making a difference. And I, I don't know how much, but that's up to God. So he says, pray for them so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. I, 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 I want to be different. I don't want to be a complainer. I, I don't want to be like the news. I want to I be a Christian who is looking to bring light and hope and, and godliness to people. And so I pray for them. I, I want my life... When, I, when that lady f- freaked out at the grocery store, the, the clerk, I, I had two options. I could say, what's the deal with you, lady? And, and quite frankly, that was probably my first thought. I can just be kind. Actually, I think, I, 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 that particularly, I know her, her name's Jewel. I said, could I pray for you? I said, I, I bet it's really stressful for you right now, isn't it? In the grocery, I mean, I would have thought about a clerk, but... 
I mean, people are just, they're fighting over toilet paper. Here, you can have mine. I'll go in the woods. <laughs> we actually had two big bags at home, so we were cool. Do, do, do you, under, do you get what I'm saying? The Bible says you're to bring peace. Remember, we're passing through. And, and while we're here, we're to bring something. Our, our hope is not in this life. My hope isn't that I won't get COVID and, and the, the racial riots won't strike my town. And, and my hope is in eternity. See, it's, it's not in the, that the market's going to be good or I'm going to be able to, you know. The, what's the worst? The worst that could happen to me, I guess, would be that I'd, I'd get COVID and die. And then I would go to be with Jesus in heaven, which is more amazing than I could imagine forever. How many say that's a good deal? See? But we don't, we don't think like that because we live in this. And so when stuff happens in this, we freak out. There's no toilet paper in the grocery store. I, and I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if somebody came up and told me later, you know what, we had a panic attack about toilet paper. And, and when I go, it, 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 honestly, still at the grocery store, sometimes you go to buy something, it's not there. But again, we're, we won the lottery. We get the billion dollars. This is one night in a cheap motel, right? And I'm going to be really happy in this motel. A amen? So how do you do that? Well, that's, that's point number three. Jesus, he tells us, he says, I want, you to live, I want you to live right. I want you to love people. I want you to stay close to the cross. All right? And then I want you to bring peace wherever you go. I want you to be a, a person that brings the peace of God into the circumstances. And, and I'm not talking about when people are freaking out and say, well, I have the peace of God. That's not at all what I, I'm talking about. You, you, there's something in you that's always looking to serve and care and love. And the way you do it is by point number three. It's by faith. Now, I, I think there's things that as Christians we... We get kind of twisted. We, we tend to look at faith as some kind of power to make things happen. But at its very core, faith is just simple trust in God. And I, I love some of the worship songs we sang today. They, I mean, I don't know if you knew what I was preaching on, but it just it seemed to fit so well. Our, our hope is in Jesus. And, and God says, rest in me, trust in me, and, and I'll take care of it. Let me, let me read a scripture, a couple of scriptures there. In uh, um, Luke 18, 8, he says, uh, uh, when the Son of Man, uh, how much of that persistent faith will the Son of Man find when he returns to the earth? Second Peter, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives, blameless and pure. Jeremiah, this is, uh, I get to, this, I like this sermon because I get to use some of my favorite scriptures. Jeremiah 17, 7 says this, blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made God their hope and their confidence. They're like trees planted along the riverbank. Now, I live in Montana, and I live in, in uh, west, of, uh, east of the mountains. So most of the land is, is kind of flat land and grassland and so on. I, I, don't, I think you have some of it like that here. And, and you look out, and everything is just brown grass, and then you'll see all of a sudden a clump of trees. And, and the reason they're there is because there's water there. Uh, I, I, again, I don't know what your weather's like here, but we, we can get 110 above and we can get 50 below. That's, that's pretty extreme. It can be real, we can have real dry years. We'll have, we've had years we'd have maybe five inches of rain and then we can have some wet years. We can, you know, but and now, now it's just kind of weird. I don't know, it's global warming or, or just God messing with us. But anyway, it's just, it, but, but these trees stay green all, every year. They, they, the leaves, because they're by water. And that's a picture of how God wants us to be. And no matter what's going on, say, I, 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 because my hope is in the Lord, it doesn't matter the circumstances of my life. And he says, uh, blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They're like trees planted along the riverbanks whose roots reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried about long months of drought or COVID, or racial tension, 
or economic difficulty or climate change. They're not worried about that stuff. Why? Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. What, what's the secret to that? They're planted by the water. They're, they're tied into Jesus. I, I want to trust him. Because God says, Bob, I want you to bring peace to life. Now, when you start seeing that, wherever you go, and whatever you encounter, you, you represent the Lord. When you leave here today and you go out to lunch and uh, the waitress messes up your order, you have a choice. You can freak out. And I, I've been with Christians who have freaked out in restaurants. How many, how many have ever been with somebody that pitched a fit in a restaurant? Or you can be kind. Why? Because you have the peace of God. It's, it's, it's that simple. When, when, when your, your neighbor does something that doesn't seem right to you or uh, even, even things that happen in your community, you can, you can speak and stand for righteousness but you're to be a people of peace, even, even the way we do it. Too. And, and the people you're speaking to, God says, I want you to love them and pray for them. I want you to bring the peace of God. Let me, let me give you one last scripture. In, in Second Corinthians, uh, uh, oh, I just realized I forgot a whole portion of my message in the last deal. I'm, I'm going to tell you a story. I didn't do this in first service. In, the, uh, in, in 2 Kings chapter 5, there's this great story of a, a guy, he's uh, from Aram, which was probably the major power of the day. Um, I, I, Israel had split into two kingdoms because of, uh, of one man's selfishness, Rehoboam. And there was a southern kingdom, which was Judah and Benjamin and some Levites, and the northern kingdom was the rest of the tribes. And from that time on, they had all kinds of difficulties in war. The king of Judah generally was fairly godly. The king of Aram was not so godly. His name was uh, Jeroboam, I think. And uh, it says that he was a little bit, he was better than his father. His father was Ahab, which he was known as the wickedest king that ever lived. Jeroboam was better than his father and, and probably was a believer in God, not necessarily a server, servant of God, but he did believe in God. Well, this, the most powerful kingdom was Aram, which was uh, the king there had a, had a general named um, Nahum. Uh, I believe the, the, the king's name was Ben-Hadad ben or something like that. And uh, Nahum had leprosy. Um, now, when the Bible uses the term leprosy, it could be some kind of skin disease. Now, he loved his general. He was, he, was the, he was like the senior commander of the most powerful army in the area. Okay, But he had this physical disease, leprosy, where it was pretty serious. And the king loved him. They, in the process of fighting these battles, had captured this little girl from Israel and brought her back as a slave in, in this general's house. And so the girl tells the, the general's wife, she says, why doesn't, my, why doesn't the general go to Israel? There's a prophet there that can heal him. All right, and so he goes to the king and he says, I've heard that there's a prophet in Israel that can heal me. And the king gets excited. He loves this guy because he's, he's won all his battles for him. He said, uh, I, I forget, I think it's like 750 pounds of silver and 100 pounds of gold and, and all these suits and all this clothing, all this stuff. He said, I want you to take that, give it to the king, and, and get yourself healed. So the guy takes his troops, and he goes there. And it, this is a, a picture of what I'm talking about today. And he goes to the king of Israel, and he says, I, I can get healed here. And the king freaks out. It actually... Uh, says he, he he tore his clothes. I I was going to as an illustration when I first preached this message. I was going to wear a shirt and tear it all in pieces, but then I thought I wasn't sure I could tear it, so I I didn't do it. Plus, 
I need to keep a shirt on while I'm preaching, my wife says. Um, <clears throat> but he responds, if, if you can picture this, like a believer. And the pressure comes because he's in a circumstance where he says, I don't know what to do. Have, have you ever been there? Something happens, you just don't know what to do. Maybe, maybe you know, we talked about toilet paper, but there's a lot more serious stuff than I don't know what to do. And so the king is, I don't know what to do. And, and, and why are you telling me this? And, and uh, uh, somebody says, well, you need to send him to the prophet. Now, this is a godly man. And so Nahum, this general, comes with his troops and comes up to this prophet. And he says, Elijah, he said, uh, he's in the, Elijah, some of the stuff in the Bible is just so cool. He says, uh, he just sends his servant out. He doesn't, doesn't even go out of the house. He sends his servant out to talk to him. And, and it ticks the, the general off. He's a real, real big shot. And his servant comes up to him and says, what do you want? And he says, uh, well, I came here to get healed. He says, well, my, my master tells me for you to go down to the Jordan River and dunk seven times, you'll be healed. Now, how, how many when you want God to do something, you want it to be really look cool? You know, like, <laughs> some of the guys does things in very simple ways. And, and he gets offended and he storms off. He says, I'm a king. We got better rivers than back in my home. And he's leaving and his, his, his uh, attendants, his, his, uh, you know, the guys with him say, come on, why don't you just try it? You know, you know, we can't hurt anything. You know, and, and they're talking to a really powerful general and I'm sure they're talking. He says, all right. And he goes down the river and he dunks seven times. And, and it says that his skin was as smooth as a baby's butt. Uh, it's in, in Bob Johnson translation. It actually says it's smooth as a baby's skin. So here's this guy who had this terrible skin disease. He's completely healed. Because he goes to someone, and I want you to catch this, whose hope is in the Lord, who trusts the Lord. He goes back. This is the most powerful general in the world probably at that time. He goes back, and he has a different conversation now with Elisha. And he says this. He said, he wants to give him all the stuff. Elisha said, I don't want anything. I don't want any of your stuff. I'm just doing what God told me to do. And this general says, can I, can I do this? Can I take two donkey loads of dirt from here so that when I worship, I can kneel on the ground of Israel? I read that, first time I read that, I started to cry. I said, God, you took this powerful man whose life is in turmoil and people in the world were, were terrorized by and you broke something in him because you gave him real hope to where he says, can I, can I just have some dirt from Israel? He takes it back and, Elijah, and this is what Elijah says, go in peace. See, he, he's a, a peace bringer. God says to you, 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 you're more than you think you are because God lives in you. And you, you live in a world that's just terribly broken and, and, and scared and, and panicky and they're making all kinds of of crazy ideas and decisions and trying to do things and, and they may act arrogant and proud, but you have the real stuff. You have the real stuff. And when we bring that peace to people, God will straighten their thinking out. I, I, I just love the picture of this proud general going home with two donkeys full of dirt. <laughs> So we can kneel on it and worship God. Let me give you one more scripture. In uh, Philippians 2.15, it says, Go out in the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in the squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry the light-giving message into the night. I have no idea what the future holds. I have thoughts and opinions, but I, I don't know. But I know this, it doesn't matter. I, I have a mission 
to let real hope come through my life to touch real people that Jesus died for. And so, uh, do the right stuff. Don't, don't take yourself too seriously. David says, uh, we're, we're like a breath. But, but we have the living God living in us. And so because you trust God in the midst of that brokenness, bring the peace of God wherever you go. And you'd be astounded what God will do with your broken life because it's surrender him. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Will you bow your heads, please? Father, I, uh, I just pray for every heart here. God, I, I know that I, I don't want to in any way make light of, of the different things people have gone through and the struggles people have had and, and the fears that have caught in their hearts. But, but God, our hope is in you. We're, we're not like Jeroboam, God. We don't, we don't live in fear because we don't know what to do. God, we're, we, we serve the living God. And God, you'll lead us through that. So I pray you give your people peace that they can bring that peace to the world around them. While your heads are bowed, let me ask if there's anybody here today that doesn't have a right relationship with Jesus. Um, maybe you've never been born again. You've never given your life to him. Or maybe you have, but walked away from it. I did that for years. In both cases, God is reaching out to you right now. That's why, why you're here. I, whatever circumstances brought you here, that's why you're here. Or online, maybe there's someone online like this. And so if you want to get right with God, you want to give your life to Jesus, or you want to come back to Jesus today, I, I just want to pray for you. I want to help you in that by praying for you. So if that's you, would you slip your hand up? Just say, Pastor, I, I, I need to get right with God. The rest of you should just be praying. Is there anyone like that? We had a lady in the first service that got right with God. Anyone else that you just need to online? If you're online and, and God's moving in your heart to do this, would you please call the church this week and talk to Pastor Owen or, or uh, Pastor Stacy, one of the pastors, and say, hey, help me. And that's why they're here. But anybody here in the room, one more time, just ask. I want to pray for one other thing, too. If you've really been struggling with this idea of peace, and maybe even as I was talking, you're just saying, how do I do this? Uh, you know, God understands where you're at, and he'll help you. But if you, you'd like prayer for that, I, I'm, I've, been, I've been pretty uptight about stuff, and I want, to, I want to get past this. Would you slip your hand up so I can pray for you? All right? Anyone else? You just, all right? I know there's several of you like that, probably all of us to some degree. Anyone else who just need, I need help, Pastor. Amen, amen. Anyone else? All right, anyone else? You know, God cares. He understands us. He, he made us. He knows what we're like. He knows what's going on in our life. All right, Lord, you, you see the hearts of these people. You see what, what, what they're struggling with. You see the things that cause fear in their life. God, I, I pray the peace of God that passes understanding would be their portion. And God, that they, they would, um, e e even tomorrow, they'd wake up with a different attitude and they'd realize their hope is in you and God, they'd rest in that. So God, help them. Help all of us, God, to trust in you, to rest in you. We ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Pastor Owen.